made a transition from the music recorded to all of a sudden the technology. We wanted to make sure everything's up and ready. As you probably know, we're being live streamed today both on Facebook and YouTube, and uh, we're recording this for uh, you, uh, YouTube for later. We'll also have DVDs available, not today, but for anybody else that maybe needs to send your family and friends. So as they're working to get this completely live, Bo's going to play for us. So thanks for being here.
you, but I, I could listen to Bo all day long. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks for being here today. I know some of you have come from long distances to be here. Denver, I heard someone was from. And uh, so we want to say thank you for doing that, for joining together. Today is a very special day because we are celebrating uh, Janet's birthday today. And uh, I couldn't help but think when I woke up this morning uh, of a uh, time I was in Rome and saw the catacombs and the tour guide had said, pointed out the different people who were the Christians who had died. And they had one date on their, uh, in the wall and that was the date of their birthday. And I said, oh, that's pretty neat. And they said, no, you don't understand. That was the date of their death. They considered it their birthday. And uh, so today here we're celebrating her birthday, earthly birthday, but we know that she has celebrated her eternal birthday forever. We know where Janet is, that she's alive more now than ever before. And uh, we're here to celebrate her life, the way she touched our lives, made us better by her presence. Every one of us probably could have stories for hours about how uh, she made us better people and taught us about Jesus. Because one of the things that she loved more than anything else was Jesus himself. And as she closed her eyes in life, uh, not too long ago, right there was Jesus standing there saying, let's go home. And there she is. So today is for us to celebrate her life. And as we do so, let's open with a word of prayer. Would you bow with me? Almighty God, we thank you for an opportunity to come together as your people, your children. And I thank you for Janet, the gift that she was, the gift that she still is. That for her, life is, that, that death has passed, pain has ended, and she jumped into your arms. And what a celebration that must have been. But today, Lord, we pray that in the time that lies before us, we would have uh, great comfort from your word. That Jesus, you said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, though they were dead, yet shall they live. And those who live and believe in me will never die. And Janet believed that promise as we do too. And so we know for her that she is alive in, in beauty and power the way you originally intended it. And we thank you all for this. Uh, Jesus, that you died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead, and then told us, do not be afraid. And so we are not afraid. But as our hearts grieve, as we say goodbye, remind us that we're only saying God's feet until we join with her again one day soon. What a joy that will be. Bless us this morning as we gather together as family and friends, and uh, just again, Holy Spirit, draw us together, comfort us, and remind us of the resurrection to eternal life and that Janet is alive. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of the scriptures we'll read for today uh, is, well, actually, I'm going to wait on that one. Uh, a couple of scriptures that are very important to Janet. We'll, we'll come back to them in a moment, but uh, Bo's going to sing a song for us. We'll do one of the old favorites. Well, great is that name. So let's stand and sing.
was one of the requests that Janet made for uh, her service. We had, gosh, I know it, it's hard to say this, but what a gift it was when Janet knew that she was dying, that we had a chance to sit down together and plan for today. Of course, none of us knew that we'd be doing this outside or with masks on or any of that, but uh, the structure of the service today is what really Janet wanted. She wanted this hymn play, Great Is Thy Faithfulness, because it really rang true for her life. It was her message that God is so great. Great is God's faithfulness. And then she chose the scripture uh, from Ephesians 3, and she said, Ross, would you read this and, and do the meditation on it? I said, absolutely. Uh, Ephesians 3 is uh, written by Paul while he's in jail at Rome. He's writing to the church at Ephesus. And he writes these words about God's salvation for the world. And uh, the Gentiles, and who would know, this great Pharisee, Paul, uh, came to the understanding of knowing Jesus and then realizing salvation is for everyone, the Gentiles too. And he burst forth in a song of praise. I can imagine him uh, in the jail cell talking to one of his scribes, and all of a sudden he's talking about God's theology and what God has done. He just couldn't help it. He had to burst forth in praise. He says these words, For this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp the wide and long and high and deep, how, how wide and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And I can just see that image of, of Paul bursting forth in that praise and perhaps jumping around the cell and singing because this revelation is... God's salvation is for all people who would accept it, and how beautiful. But, but to talk about the width and the depth and the love of Christ, that's what Janet wanted us to know. In her life, also, she wanted us to know that God can do incredibly more than we could ever ask or imagine. And uh, I, I know this resonates with me because when I sat with Janet uh, time and time again to have coffee or to talk about her life, no matter how many times I met with her, I feel like I still didn't even know her. But there was more. And wait, there's more. And it was just powerful because she recognized that in her life, God had done things that she never would have planned. It was better than before. And um, as she was preparing to die, and we had those precious moments together, she looked back on her life and she saw how God had done amazing things. I mean, working with Pat Boone, I mean, every woman in the world wanted to marry him. And, you know, he is the great star. And, and, and she just said, wow, and I, I got to work with him to be with him and all of you here from ministries throughout the generations just how she treasured those moments she loved those moments because she really felt as though she was proclaiming the gospel and everything she did i learned about her singles ministry and i think there's a book that she wrote during that time over there and, uh, her prominence her time with television shows and 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 then her uh, programs and yet through it all Janet was one of the most humble people I ever met I kept having to coax her to draw out more from her life and no matter how many times we met I felt like there was still yet more I asked her to teach classes here at the church as she was saying you know I, I need something to do and I said oh we've got things for you to do Janet <laughs> and uh, she began teaching classes uh, here at the church but she also taught classes and covered for me for Bible studies over at Olive Plaza we had this beautiful Thank you for being here. Beautiful Bible study Tuesday nights, which hopefully we'll return again to soon. And uh, we just have an hour together uh, in a recreation room across the street and talk about the Bible. And no matter what I said, Janet always would, it, would, would have something more that I didn't know. And it's just the person that she was. One day I was taking a woman from our church to a cancer specialist, and I sat in the lobby with the woman out of the doors came Janet because she had just visited doctor, uh, her cancer doctor. And it was at that moment that I realized that all I knew about Janet, I realized at this moment, she's mortal. She's going to die. And I think that hit my heart because I realized that though Janet had been struggling with cancer, this was now an image that she is going to die. And yet she made the most of her time. And she would talk about those plans. 
Like I think today she's smiling down upon all of us, just thinking about all of you being here to celebrate her life. A couple weeks ago, we were in her apartment and planning the service today, and her faith was amazing. One of the conversations I had with her throughout the last couple of years was the 23rd Psalm. She loved the 23rd Psalm. And she, she talked about trusting in the Lord, how this shepherd on the hillside of Bethlehem had sung these words, became one of the greatest kings in history, and all the things that it talks about just encapsulates life and, and faith with, with God. A person who knows God is lavished upon with great things. The feast that God prepares, the anointing of the head, the cup that overflows and runs over. We talked about the valley of the shadow of death, and she shared with me about how, you know, it's really just a shadow, not a reality. Because of what Jesus had done, it's just a shadow, and we are not to be afraid. And so I thought about those words as I received the phone call from some of you telling me that she had crossed from life to eternal life. And there was this image that came to my heart as I thought about Janet and her love for Jesus. That one moment her eyes closed on this life and they opened to see Jesus who had always been there with her. But now she jumped into his arms. And I, for some reason, thought of these beautiful words from the Song of Songs, Song of Solomon, in which I felt as if Jesus probably said to her, Arise, my darling, my beautiful one. Come with me. See, the winter is past, the rains are over and dawn, flowers appear on the earth, the season of singing has come, the cooing of doves is heard in our land. The fig tree forms its early fruit, the blossoming vines spread their fragrance. Arise, come, my darling, my beautiful one, come with me. And she went. And she didn't feebly get out of bed. She jumped out of bed. In fact, we know, according to what we write, read in the scripture, that the place where God is, there's no more pain, no more suffering. No more beds, no more wheelchairs, no more canes needed because we're made perfect. And I have this image of her standing with Jesus and Jesus walking with her through the valley of the shadow of death and now bringing her into the fullness of life and then saying to her at one point, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then placing that winner's wreath, the crown upon her head. And Jenna just smiling, because the race had been won. She fought the good fight, and now that crown was upon her. I imagine her standing with Jesus, and I love the words. I want to use this one scripture as, as I end the meditation today. Jesus said, after being with his disciples for at least three years, he said to them, he turned to them one day, he knew he was going to die, they didn't understand, and he said these words, do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But now I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also, and the way you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And in that dialogue, Jesus would end by saying, My peace I give to you, not the same one the world gives, give I to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not let them be afraid. And that's the message for us, I think Janet would want us to know. That God can do incredibly beyond anything we can ever ask or even imagine. Because it came true in her life. And it's true for us as well. But then when we come to that moment, we don't die. We cross from life to eternal life. And there's Jesus who will say, welcome home. And this final image I had of Janet was one in which she looked at Jesus. And standing beside him was her husband. And her mother. And her father. And all those who had gone before. And they all said in glorious shout. Janet, welcome home. And friends, you and I will go home one day and when I stand next to Jesus, I want to see Janet standing next to him say to me, friend, welcome home. Jesus said, I'm the resurrection of life. Death can't touch you in him. Amen. Bernie, you have a song for us. I said I was going to be strong and hold back, and after hearing this, it melts my heart. 
But I gotta tell you, there's so much I could say about Janet and our relationship. I was with her when she was in her Sinkies ministry a few times and, and uh, participating in that. And so the book that she wrote, it, there's even some extra copies there for any of you who might be interested. But, and uh, just the display of the cassette tapes of her teachings at the retreat that she had. I was a part of that. In our family, we had the uniqueness of, of music throughout our family. And Janet sang, Janet played the piano. My mom played the piano, played the organ. Uh, I became musical, I sang and uh, led worship and directed choirs. But it was the small church that my dad took a pastor of in Silmar. And when we started there and Janet came and I was there, that we had, the church was being run by the fixes. Janet was at the piano, my mom was at the organ, I was leading the worship, my dad preached, and I was also the youth director. But in all that singing and all the music that went on all the time, and Janet and I sang duets together there, she accompanied me time and again as I sang solos in the church. She came up with a name. She says, you know, we ought to call ourselves the fixations. <laughs> And that was not just for that moment, but that carried kind of a connotation of us the rest of her life. We're the fixations. <laughs> and uh, so I'm going to try to live up to a little of that. And uh, she had some special songs. Uniquely, just a couple weeks before she passed, and we were down from Modesto, and <clears throat> she could could not walk. She could barely walk and get around. She had to be helped. She was frail. But she had her friends come down to her apartment. She went and sat at the piano in her apartment. I got to play the piano for her. So she had to play a couple of songs as frail as she was and had me come and sing the songs that she played at that time. That was what, two weeks before she passed? Just about. It's around that time that she says, I need you to sing at my, my service, memorial service. And the song that was her choice points to Jesus, as her whole life did, pointing to Jesus. It will be worth it all.
second of five children in a family where life revolved around church. My mom would tell me that some of her happiest memories, as my uncle just spoke of, were singing and playing the piano during church services with her brother Bernie, her mom playing the organ, and her dad preaching. My mom attended Azusa College, now known as APU, for a couple years before she left to start her career. She was a really hard worker, smart and organized and able to talk to pretty much anyone. So it's no surprise that when an opportunity came up to become the personal assistant to the entertainer Pat Boone, she got the job. This would end up being the career that she worked until retirement, minus a few years in the middle to raise me. During this time, she also became a singles minister and began a singles organization in the Los Angeles area. She appeared on Christian television and radio shows and even had a column in a women's magazine. Her ministry was so important to her and she made a lot of connections that lasted her her whole life. It was during this time she also wrote a book called For Singles Only about how a single person can find purpose and contentment in Christ. I've been told that this book is very good, however, there are subjects discussed in it that no son wants to hear the most. <laughs> so I can't say that I've read it. But as my uncle said, we've got a box of them over there for sale by the photos if you'd like to get a copy. Ironically, it was during one of her speaking engagements to promote this book about the single life that she met my dad, David St. Pierre. They developed a quick friendship, 
but romance <clears throat> was not part of their relationship because as my dad would often say, they were brother and sister in the Lord. My mom said that she never even thought of marrying him until the day he proposed. This proposal happened on the way back to my dad's apartment after a picnic. And in what I can only imagine to be one of the most awkward conversations ever, my dad asked, what would you say if I told you God told me that we would be married in the next six months? <laughs> Son, my mom replied, do you hear voices often? <laughs> Somehow my dad lucked out and they got married when I was born about a year later. Growing up, my parents worked in ministry together at a couple different churches in the South Bay area. And when I went to a Christian elementary school, my mom volunteered there and later became the church secretary. She could always find a way of keeping me close by and in her sights. After my wife, Summer, and I got married and moved to Burbank, my parents moved here too, so that they could be closer to us and later their grandsons, Jack and Henry. By then, my dad's health was failing, but my mom took really good care of him until he passed away four years ago. During this entire time, she was tough. She never complained, and she always did what had to be done. I would hoped that after my dad died, my mom would find a new freedom in life and finally be able to do some of the things she'd missed out on for so long. But it was during this time that my mom was forced to find a new place to live and began having health problems of her own. And in what was a very negative and difficult time, she persevered and once again showed everyone how tough she was. But God was faithful and really blessed her when she found a new home just down the street at Olive Plaza. She finally found herself back in a community. She made friends. She found a church, this one, and for a short time taught Sunday school class here. She had finally made it back into the Bible teacher role that I know she had been missing after so many years. And even after finding out she had cancer, this community brought joy and a new purpose into her life, and it was a very happy time for her for a few years. I'm so thankful to her friends over at All Plaza, Phyllis and Ann, and everyone else who was always there for her. And I can't thank my family enough, my Aunt Anita, Uncle Bernie, and Betty, my cousin Diana, who came down here so many different times and from so far away to help care for my mom, especially in this last year. When it got close to the end, my mom never had to be alone because of the sacrifices you all made uh, to be here with her. And it meant so much to her that you were willing to do that. And I really don't know what we would have done without you. On July 29th, Janet St. Pierre passed away peacefully, surrounded by her family. She's no longer suffering, and with that comes a lot of relief. But we will miss her. My boys will miss the treats that Granny Jan always had ready for them in her purse and when we visited her home. We'll miss seeing her on the sidelines of their basketball and baseball games. And we'll miss having her over for dinner and celebrating holidays with her. But since today would have been her 80th birthday, this seems like a perfect way to celebrate her life. Thanks. Oh, you got it. I wasn't sure if I should introduce you, but you're in front of <laughs> Diana, Martinez, come on up. I wasn't going to say anything, I was just going to read, but I'm going to say something. Um, I lost out on a lot of years with my aunt growing up for a variety of different reasons. Um, but in recent years, um, it kind of began when my grandmother passed away. I began to develop a relationship with her again. And I have to say that 
I can't, words cannot express the love that I have for my aunt that I've had since I was a little girl. Um, I wanted to be just like her. I wanted to grow up to and aspire to be who she was and emanate her in the world. When she was, she was just full of grace. She was full of beauty. She was full of dignity. Um, she was humble, and she loved well. And I used to ask God, who prays for me, God? Who prays for me? Because I felt alone for a lot of years. And it was in those first few years, getting to know my aunt again, um, that she said that for years she had prayed. My aunts and uncles had prayed. They had fasted. And I absolutely believe that because of those prayers and the fasting, that I'm okay today. I'm here, and I will forever treasure the times that I had with her. Um, getting to know her again, I come down to visit, and all she wanted to talk about was Jesus. She wanted to talk about Jesus. She wanted to talk about eternal things. And those conversations did more for me and for my heart than she'll ever know, than she will ever know. And all I can say is, you are missed. You are so loved, and you're having a birthday celebration far greater than anything we could give you here. I will love you forever, and I hope to make you proud. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Sorry. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And that's 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Janet used to say regularly that she just wanted everybody that she knew and had relationship with to know Jesus, the peace, the love, the joy that he gave. She just wanted everybody to know him. So if you don't know him, her, her wish would be that you would come to know him in a really personal, individual way. You are all very much loved.
Thanks again, Bo. We have a brief moment in uh, the service this morning to share maybe some thought that you might have of Janet's life. Uh, we're going to ask you to come to the podium to share it because this is being online, live streamed and uh, recorded as well. But uh, you don't have to share at all. You can just uh, reserve that for your family and friends and gatherings from not even today, but maybe next month or next year or whatever. But if you'd like to say a word this morning, a word or two, and, and just we just ask to keep it very brief, uh, come forward to the podium and, and share it. Let us know your name, though, because that way, just in case some of you know who you are, we'll know who you are. program but I but I am very much a part of this and glad that you've given me a chance. She's been bragging about you for many months and kept inviting me to come and be in the service and hear it and just share what she knows I was learning with what you already know and are learning and we're still learning. But because Janet was always a student as well as a teacher and one of the sweetest, strongest most virtuous, kind women I've ever known, and I was married to a pretty good one. <clears throat> oh, Janet <clears throat> knew Shirley well. In fact, I don't know if you knew, but Shirley and I sang at their wedding, her and David's wedding. And then not only were Shirley and Janet faithful prayer partners for so many years, but uh, she and David were too. There were times when he would call her because he had a prophetic gift and he would <laughs> he was right when he asked Janet, how would you feel if I told you this was a word from the Lord for him that we're going to be married within six months? Well, he, he was a prophet and it was true. And then Shirley and I took part in that. But, but, but David would call Shirley and say, Lord, I think the short Lord has shown me something. And then she would say, yeah, I think the Lord has showed me this. And they would share they were prayer partners, and that was fine with the Janet, because she and, and Shirley were too. And uh, we saw the ups and downs, and we, uh, we actually, she was driving back and forth for many years, and they were in a, a beautiful, but uh, it was a trailer court, and the driving to and from was wearing, very wearing. And so I, Shirley and I bought a house out in the valley, so that she, could, she and Dave could live there. She didn't have to drive so long. Eventually, of course, after he was gone and I was still paying for the house, <laughs> uh, we eventually had to sell that house and thank God. I mean, even though I offered to help her with whatever kind of other living conditions uh, she needed, she never called on me. She just, she and family found it all out. And uh, I just wanted you to know that I was with her in the last couple of weeks, Bernie was there, and she'd been telling me on the phone, you know, I've been diagnosed with cancer, and she, she didn't sound like she was terribly torn up about it. She was just receiving it, okay, can't do anything about it, but she says, I'm not feeling it. She <laughs> says, I'm still driving, and I feel okay. Really? And the doctors say you've got cancer throughout your body in various organs, yeah. That's what he says, but she said, and I said, Janet, that's what I'm praying, and I'm going to double down. I'm going to pray that the Lord will do for you what he did for my wife, who in the last year of her life was bedridden, hospice-ridden, taken care of at home, and, uh, and, and with something they call vasculitis, which is inflammation of the whole vascular system. She should have been in terrible pain all the time. But I had discovered a product, this is not a commercial, called Relief Factor, and I got it for her, at four natural products, and she, uh, it was hard for her to take because they're big capsules. She had trouble swallowing them, but I, just, I developed a method by which she would take one. I said, just 15, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, take this one. So she would get the one down. And then I said, okay, that was 30 seconds, now let's do another one. And two or three minutes, I would get all four down. Well, anyway, after about five weeks, I'm sorry, five days, she'd been complaining about arthritic symptoms in her back and neck as well as the vasculitis. And she said, this pain is just awful. I said, what is the pain level? She said, 
on a one to ten. Eight. That's for surely it would have been eleven for anybody else. And she said it's an eight. And so, but after about five days, taking the relief factor, she wasn't complaining. I said, "What's your pain level now?" She thought a minute. She said, three. Really? And another three or four days, she wasn't complaining. And I said, "Are you feeling any pain now?" And no. So God answered our prayer. I can't say it was just relief factor. It was really the Lord, but He was evidently using the natural products that He did create for the purpose of combating uh, inflammation, among other things, maybe. But in that last period of her life, the last few weeks, though she was ravaged, she was not feeling pain, and we were singing Blessed Assurance as Shirley breathed her last and, and was face to face with Jesus. So I told Janet, I'm praying that for you, that you will be pain free until you go meet Jesus. She said, yes, that's what I'm praying for. And that prayer was answered. At least in a couple of weeks, three, four weeks ago when I was with her last, I was holding her hand, sitting on the couch, praying. I said, you know, I think the Lord has been answering our prayer, hasn't He? You're, are you feeling any pain? No. There may have been minor irritations or some, but not enough for her to even complain about. And so I feel that the Lord answered our prayer, her prayer, our prayers, that she just blissfully went to sleep. And as you said, when her eyes opened, she was looking at the face of her Savior. And soon after that, the face of her love in this life, David. And I said to Lindy, my daughter here just now, this is why and how we live. Moments like this, when each of our times come, that we can, everybody can have that same blessed assurance that Janet has and, and Andrew and all who know her. She hasn't died. She laid that well-worn body aside and now she's fresh and new and she's with the Lord and with her parents and, and there for eternity. And that's what she wants for all of us and that's her message and it wasn't just her verbal message. Her whole life was and will always be that message. We can be there too if we follow her example. My name's Andrew. I don't know if I said that last time. <laughs> uh, one of my well, a reoccurring childhood memory is my parents allowing total strangers to come live in our house. Um, two of those strangers, uh, I don't know, I was young, I don't even know the exact circumstances, how we came to know them, but were two missionaries and their young daughter from Africa. Uh, their names were Mary and Faithful Biney. And um, that turned out to be a, a relationship that still exists today. Um, the do the donations that if people are interested in giving are directed towards their school that they have in Africa. Um, and as soon as they found out my mom passed away, they asked if uh, I could read a, a tribute letter from them. So that's what I'm going to do. Janet, do you know that you have left a legacy that has touched thousands in Africa? You gave us a home in your house. You didn't know it, but when you took us in, you were inspiring a nation. In your kitchen, ideas were born, strategies were mapped out, prayers were prayed, leading us back to Africa to make a difference. In your kitchen, a basic school with 1,300 students from kindergarten to junior high was started. A university was birthed. 20 churches were established. In your kitchen, missionaries and pastors were trained. Mercy ships came to Africa and never left. Orphanages were helped and much more. When no one wanted us and left us stranded at the airport, you believed in us and picked us up and never let us go from your heart. You have now received crowns for being a silent warrior fighting battles only God could see. Even when you walked through the valley of shadows, you lifted your head and stood strong. Your scars testified to the battles you had fought and won. You soothed others' pain with your balm of experience. Our children's children mention your name 
a true testament to a great woman of faith. Your legacy will live on till we meet again in eternity. We love you. Faithful and merry by me. Anyone else? Uh, just a very brief question. I'm Janet's uh, cousin, Stan Fix. Uh, my dad was her dad's older brother, and they both were pastors as I subsequently became a pastor. And in fact, for three years at a church in Santa Ana, Janet was my father's secretary. But one of the ways we grieve is with uh, with humor, with a, a little smile on our face. And I'd like to share an episode from Janet's wedding. <laughs> we were sitting with the family near the front. I had one child, about a year and a half old. And we were from uh, uh, an evangelical tradition but not one that speaks back to the preacher, you know, dialogues with the preacher, with an amen or whatever. And right after the booms sang, my one and a half year old daughter, Shannon, yelled out, Amen! <laughs> and my wife scooped her up and took her out of the church building. <laughs> well, what will we do? Yes, come on. God bless you all. My name is Ruth Rocha, and I have one of the greatest privileges to be at the end of life with my dear friend Janet. I was also with my dear friend David. So I had the privilege to be at the, uh, uh, with David the night before he went to be with the Lord, and with Janet a couple of days before she went to be with the Lord. So I can give testimony of what a great life of them in the, in the years that I met Janet. What a great example of how a woman of God she was. She was uh, everything and even more that everybody has said. But she was a wonderful sister. She was a wonderful mother. She was a remarkable wife. She was a great friend. And friendship is such a gift. I came to work for Janet to take care of David. That's how we, we met. But uh, Janet was the kind of person that didn't look down on anybody. And uh, from the moment that I walked in for the interview, we became friends. I didn't get the privilege to meet uh, David until I actually was taking care of him because he didn't want to meet anybody. He didn't want anybody to take care of him. I enjoy her sense of humor. I enjoy her strength even to the end. I can tell you that by the grace of God, she's, she sat strong every day to the end. I was there when the nurses couldn't understand why she was still feeling the way that she was feeling, that she's supposed to be feeling this excruciating pain and in agony, no. She was blessing when, when her beloved friends at the house needed a prayer. She would tell me, she said, Ruth, she called me Ruthie. She would say, Ruthie, wake me up when Phyllis comes. She's going through something and she needs prayer. She says, Ruthie, I'm going to, to go away. She said, but I want you to Please keep Andrew in your prayers. She carried Andrew so in her heart to the very end. 
he was his joy, her joy. He was her proud with her pride and joy. Just to look at even to that cup, <laughs> the drinking cup that, that he had given her, he gave her so much pride. You know? But she wasn't so proud of his accomplishments. He is a great man. But the kind of man that he has become, Andrew, that's what I stand here. Everybody knows Janet, but I knew your mother. I knew the heart of your mother toward you, toward her grandchildren, toward you, Summer. She was a woman that tried to understand people instead of judging them. If we wrong her, she tried to find an excuse for her wrongdoings and ask and for forgiveness to move on. She had a very forgiving heart. That's the woman that I met. A woman that preached a thousand sermons without words. That had lived a uh, footprints of Jesus and the perfume of Jesus everywhere she went. And I hope that we will continue to remember who Janet is. Because she will live in our hearts and in our memories as we look at her wonderful life. God bless you. God bless you, Andrew and family. Thank you for the privilege that you gave me to be by her side in her many days. That was an honor from Jesus. God bless you. Okay, at this time, then, well, let's close in prayer. What a, uh, just a wonderful celebration of her life with music. Bo, thanks again for leading us in worship. For the words that were said, for the scriptures that were read, they are promises to us, uh, the reminders to us of uh, Jesus who is with us, who is uh, always going to be with us, and will welcome us home. Would you bow with me in prayer? Oh God, you are the one from whom we come, unto whom we return, and in whom we live and move and have our being. And so we praise you for your good gift of life. We thank you for the way in which life unravels before us, for the mysteries, the celebrations, the sorrows. Because through them all, we know that you're there with us and you're shaping us and molding us into the image of Christ. And we thank you for this. We thank you especially today for your servant, Janet, who having lived this life in faith, now lives eternally with you. That she's more alive now than ever before, and God, one day we're going to see her again because of your son, Jesus what he has done in taking our sins upon the cross, rising from the dead, and saying, I am the resurrection and the life. And if we believe in him, we will never die. What a promise that's come true for Janet. And so we thank you for all that she was and all that she continues to be. We just ask that as we leave today, you would make our hearts faithful to follow you the rest of our days, that we would be inspired by Janet's life and her love and the things that she gave to us and the ways that she taught us about who you are, God. And so as we go today, by your Holy Spirit, comfort our hearts, comfort our lives, and make us journey this life with more passion than ever before until we cross that line and are awarded that crown because of the grace of Jesus. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Janet, fix St. Pierre, we thank you for her. We leave her in your hands asking this blessing that we would continue on in faith, and we ask all of this in the wonderful name of the Jesus that Janet proclaimed, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the first, the last, the one who was and is and is to come. We thank you for this. Bless us as we depart in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Friends, thanks for coming from distances to be here to celebrate her life. Again, take a look at the pictures. They're amazing pictures the family's put together that uh, have the categories of her life spelled out for you. Uh, and... Uh, Say hi to one another, greet one another, but remain socially distanced. <laughs> this is being recorded. We want to make sure people know that we're doing our part, too. Andrew, God bless you, you and your family. Thank you so much. Family, thank you for letting me be a part of this today. And now go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Amen.